So Mike asked me to speak uh, a couple weeks ago. He he uh, sent me a a text and said, "I'd like you to take the Sunday Palm Sunday." And I said, "Sure, I can do it." And I thought I had a message, and I he asked me last week. Do you have it? And I said, yeah, I, I got it. I know what I'm going to say. I'm all ready to go. And all week long, I could not put it together. And <laughs> Cindy, you're right. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> so this morning, Tom comes in, and he greets me, and I asked him, how's Tom? How'd your week go? And he said, Busy. I thought, yeah, mine too. Really busy. Um, unfortunately, it just seemed to roll over all of the time that I had set aside to prepare for today. And before I go any farther, I really want to recognize Tom for being the fabulous person that he is for being with us. You know, Tom came in this morning. I greeted him, and he said, so what's happening today? He didn't have any warning. And yet, Tom came up, and he did the announcements. And he shared with us, and none of you could tell that he was unprepared when he walked in the door, could you? Because Tom's always prepared. Because Tom's always prepared. And you know what? I want you guys to think about this. Tom came prepared. And I'm not going to point anybody out. But think of how many others in the body are actually active, helping, doing something. I've never been in a body where such a high percentage of people within the body step up to help, to do something. Never. Generally, it's, it's, it's you know, 10, 15, maybe 20% who say, I'm willing. Okay, I can do something. Uh, I can be an usher. I can teach Sunday school. Maybe if I have some help. You know, it's, it's a small percentage. But not here. Nearly every single member of the body has been active in the body and outside taking the word from here. And I'm blessed because of it. And I'm sure God's blessed because of it. And I wanted to make sure you guys heard that you're recognized, you're noticed, you're appreciated. You too, Daniel. <laughs> Not just your mom, but you too, Daniel. And you know, I didn't expect to be sharing that with you guys this morning, but that's one thing that God laid on my heart as we were going through worship listening to Tom, he said, make sure that you let everybody know how much they're appreciated. And that really leads to one phrase I'd like to leave with you guys. So I'm going to give a message. It's not the message that I planned originally, and it's not the whole message that I ended up with at the end of the week, last week, but I'm going to share. But here's a little bit that I want you to take home with you. And it follows what Tom said. He asked us if we were living a life worthy of the price that was paid for us, not by us, for us. So here's what I want you to consider. Never 
diminish what you were put on this earth to do. However big, however little. You're the only one who can do it. It needs to be done. We need it from you. David, I don't know where you are right now. I just want to thank you for being the heartbeat of this body. It hit me during worship. You are the heartbeat of this body. Thank you so much. You know, when we were singing, this picture came up and the words were, Holy Spirit, come and fill this place. Flood. Yes, I felt that. Thank you, Don. Flood the atmosphere. I felt that, that the Holy Spirit came and joined us at that point. I hope the rest of you notice that as well. And Holy Spirit, I hope you're always welcome here. You know, I remember the very first time that I actually welcomed the Holy Spirit in my life. I was 18. I had just been out for a joyride, my own car, but I didn't have a license. I didn't have insurance. And I wasn't supposed to be taking it out, and I knew that. But I just wanted to go practice driving. And the car had a problem, and I was stranded out in the country. And I knew I was in trouble. You see, if the car wouldn't have had a problem, I could have gotten home in time, and nobody would have ever known, but now everyone was going to know because I had to walk home, those miles home, then I was going to have to tell Dad, and then I was going to have to have Dad help me bring the car home. And I, sh I was scared. And my dad wasn't a gentle father. I mean, he wasn't mean, but he wasn't gentle. And I knew that I was wrong, and I was going to pay for it. And I sat there in the car, and for the first time in my life, I said, God, help me. And the peace of the Holy Spirit came down on me. And I went from a place of fear to a place of peace with no transition, just it was there. You would think that because of that, it would have impacted my life enough that I would have made a change in my life, but that's not the case. It took me a lot more years, nearly another decade, before I really made the change in my life. But that was the first time. And it was definite. And I still haven't forgotten it. And I'm still grateful that God was willing to hear me in my time of need. So this week as I was trying to prepare, trying to put a message together, there was only one thing that kept coming back to me. Communion. God kept saying, communion. Okay, I, I, can, I can honor that, Lord, but why 
are we supposed to have communion? And so he sent me back and started me looking, and I thought, but I'm supposed to be talking about Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. and I mean, that's this time of the year, and that's what folks are expecting to hear. And God said, well, you can say a couple of words there, but keep it to just a few. And I started thinking about what we know about Palm Sunday and why people's attitudes were what they were. And I've heard a lot of different messages that take us from one point to another, trying to bring that up. But, but here's what God laid on my heart. He said, remember what Jesus came and preached. What, what did Jesus proclaim when he began his ministry? He said, the kingdom of God is at hand. Jews were ready for that message. They were oppressed. They were under the dominion of the Roman Empire. Now, mind you, they had been under the dominion of Egypt. They had been taken out. They had been given their own land. They fought for their land. They misused their land. They were taken and put, in, put under the dominion. They were returned to their land. They were conquered back and forth and back and forth. And this was one of those times where they're not free. But Jesus was coming to them and saying, the kingdom of God is at hand. That's what they wanted. But what they wanted and what he brought were not the same thing. Because they were looking for a political kingdom. And Jesus brought them a spiritual kingdom. And so they were hoping, expecting, desiring something other than what he was bringing into them. And so when they are greeting him as he's coming in, Hosanna, they're saying, save us. Take us back to liberty. Take us back to being in charge of our own destiny. And Jesus said, the kingdom is already here. The kingdom's at hand. I said, okay, Lord, so knowing that and knowing that that's where you're leading me, why are we looking at communion today as being the focal point of the message that you're sending through me. And he said, just go read. You can look it up. You can read your Bible. All the information's there, and you know it already. So I went back, and I looked at it, and I read the Last Supper. You know, we've get, got three fairly cohesive accounts. It doesn't show up quite as clearly in John. And then I realized that, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not where Jesus explained for the first time that his body and his blood were to be given to us and that we were to eat his body and his blood. In fact, that took place about six months earlier. And he had been preaching. And I'm going to go there. So those of you who have your, your Bibles, let's go to John chapter 6, verse 25. And I'm going to back up just a little bit and read real fast from verse 22. But prior to that, just know that Jesus had, just prior to this, walked on water to the disciples. 
So verse 22, the next day the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake because Jesus had left and the apostles and they'd gone across realized that only one boat had been there and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples, but that they had gone away alone. So, of course, I'm sure they're wondering, where'd Jesus go? Now, we know the disciples got in the boat and took off, but where'd Jesus go? Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. So now verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. So he rebukes them, first of all. You didn't come see me because of the miracles. Now, the miracles are what told them that here's a prophet. And in fact, within their history, within their um, prophecies, the specific miracles that the Messiah would do were already laid out. Not necessarily who and when, but the types. And that this many and this kind had to be done. And he's saying, you're not coming because of the miracles even though the miracles pointed specifically to him. He's saying, you're coming because you got fed. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Here's a big one. Okay, if we're not supposed to expect to be justified by works, and yet Jesus is asked, what is the work that we must do to do what God requires? Let's see what he says. Jesus answered, the work of God is this. To believe in the one he has sent. That's our big work. That's our big work. We need to believe. Why did it take me 10 years from the time I experienced the presence of the Holy Spirit for the first time until I reached that stage where I truly believed. I'm just human. Why does it take somebody else an entire lifetime? Why do some people get it immediately? I don't know. It took me 10 years. And I'd had the presence of the Holy Spirit come upon me, and it took me 10 years or more to believe. So they asked him, what miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert. It, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Look. Jesus had already been doing miracles. He'd fed the 5,000. And they're still asking, what sign? They're not any different than I was. I mean, I could say, if I were there, I would have recognized it from the feeding of the 5,000. Wait a minute. I had the Holy Spirit come upon me 
in no uncertain terms, and it took me 10 years, how can I judge them? So I'm not going to. I'm just going to continue to read. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives, his, and gives life to the world. In this case, Jesus is not saying and gives his life for the world. He's saying he who comes down and gives life to the world. The kingdom of God is at hand. There is life in this world. We all have the ability now to partake of the life that Jesus brought to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you've seen me and still do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. Isn't that refreshing to know that Jesus has said, come. All of you that my father has given to me, come. I'll never drive you away. You come. You're welcomed. You're embraced. And you're never driven away. That's a huge relief to me because I see my life and I say, in and of myself, I don't have the capacity, the righteousness, the right to claim any of this life that Jesus brought. But he said, your work is is to believe. He says it's not to clean up your life. It's not to change. And he wants us to do that too. But that's not our work. He said our work is to believe. And he, then he said, and I bring life to this world. And if you believe, and if you come, because you are the ones that my father has given to me, I'll never drive you away. Huge relief to me when I realized I'm not going to screw up big enough to fall out of his grasp. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will but to do the will of him who sent me and this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me. Not only will he not drive you away, it doesn't matter what you are going to do, but he's going to lose none of us. None of me, none of you, none of us. He's not going to lose a single one of us. Those are awesome promises. I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. That's a whole sermon in itself. But I'm not going there. <laughs> I pass it on. Thanks, <laughs> For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. 
my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. I'm going to skip ahead now. I'm going to go down to verse 49. No, excuse me, 48. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that come, came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now he says something a little bit differently. my flesh that I will give for the life of the world. Before he said, I came down to bring life to the world. But now he's telling them that he's going to give his flesh for the life of the world. says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. He will live forever. And God said, that's why communion, to remind you. Because I think some of you may be like me and need to be reminded on occasion, often, constantly, that God has provided us eternal life. Sometimes I wonder how come I can be so dense because it takes me a long time sometimes to get a thought to stick within me. And sometimes if it's the wrong thought, it takes a lot longer to get it out so that I can replace it with a correct thought. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. It's a reminder that we are partaking of eternal life. It's a reminder that Jesus lives within us. Wait a minute. It said more than just that. It also said that whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. That was a surprise to me. Because I've read that verse. I've read it over and over and over and it didn't click. Jesus is in us. Guess what? We also are in him. That's a concept I'm going to have a bit of time pulling in, and I don't know that I'll ever understand it, but it's one that I know that God knew that I needed to have as part of my way of thinking. Jesus isn't just in me. I'm in him. He's in you, too. And you're in him, too. Jesus.
just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever.